From the basement of the Hot Pets Guide to the Galaxy World Headquarters located in northern Colorado, this is the Hot Pets Guide Podcast. I'm Matt Reber. I'm Brown Jake. Can a city be worth five cases of double dry hop juicy bits and a bottle of midi noche? We answer that question and more on this episode of the Hot Pets Guide Podcast. Hey there, Hopheads and Beer Geeks. Welcome to another episode of the Hopheads Guide Podcast brought to you by Beards by Nick. With me, as always, is the man who thought tree beers meant drinking three beers at one time, Jake the Brown Guy. It's not? (laughs) (laughs) I tell everybody I'm going to have tree beers. (laughs) And they just look at me. (laughs) No, it's, it's... Beers made with trees. Remember oh. we had that interview with Hidden Mother? I thought he just made three beers at a time. <laughs> he actually makes beer He's with trees? Using trees, yeah. Oh, I thought he only made three beers at a time. <laughs> I was gonna, like, your business model is shit, dude. <laughs> <laughs> but where's one of those tree beers? <laughs> it's a lot less confusing this way. <laughs> well, uh, what's been going on, man? How you doing? Uh, doing pretty good, you know, uh, Cinco de Mayo was uh, last week, and uh, we had, uh, of course, the Kentucky Derby go on, which was, uh, I thought, a little bit ridiculous, but hey, it's white people race, so white people get to tra- choose their winner. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot going on, man, on that weekend. I know. May the 4th, Cinco de Mayo. Free comic book day if you're a nerd like me. Um <laughs> Yeah, it's always that first weekend in May is always like jam packed with a lot of stuff. Just happened, my wife decided that's the weekend she wanted to be away, and I was stuck with the kids, so uh, I got to do absolutely nothing. I couldn't go to Sundance and bet on horses. I couldn't, you know, I actually didn't watch a race, so I like turned on ESPN. And when the kids are finally asleep and they're talking about it, I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so the favorite got disqualified? And the long shot won? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dude, there had to have been some people that made some good money on bets. Man. But think if, like, you saw the the favorite win and you had that long shot and you're just like, oh, fuck it. And you tore up your ticket. And they're like, <laughs> hold your ticket. Wait, what? <laughs> you mean that one? <laughs> the one I just ripped Shit. up? Shit. <laughs> Yeah, that was, uh, I didn't get to see the race either as it worked, but, you know, it it was one of those things where I'm like, oh, man, there are a couple guys that are rubbing it in the face of their buddy right now because they made that bet on the long shot oh, yeah. and none of their buddies did. Way and, to go wasting your money. Yeah, what a dumbass. You know that horse has no chance, right? Disqualified. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, uh, you know, there's some big things in the news today with uh, Dogfish Head making the merger with Sam Adams Beer Company. I know. I was a little amazed or by Boston that. Beer yeah, Company. so number two and number 13 are uh, making a little number, what would that be, nine? <laughs> yeah, I think if you <laughs> average that out, it's like a number nine. <laughs> I don't know, like, uh, I, you talk like, so Sam Adams has always been that beer, and it's kind of dropped off my radar. It used to be that beer that was like Fat Tire and a Bud Light, but you know, they're always in every restaurant you went to. Yeah, and I always ordered it. Yeah, there's always either a Sam Adams or Sam Adams Seasonal. Yeah. So you'd always want to ask what the seasonal was, because yeah. if it was like the Noble Pills, I love that beer. I thought that beer was awesome. So anytime that was in season, I was drinking that beer. Um, but they started coming out with like the Rebel Reds and the Hopped Up Blah Blah Blahs, and it just seemed like they were going off any trend that was going on in beer. Yeah. And I mean, they, I, they even made a hazy IPA. Yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just started like, oh, okay, it's Sam Adams. Like, don't and Dogfish Head. I've always loved Dogfish Head beers. You know, 180 minute Dead Man, and you know, so all I I always thought. So it was kind of weird that I saw those two like that kind of merger. You know? Yeah, it came as a bit of a surprise to me. I did not expect it. Um, it, I mean, I guess I get it. You know. And a little bit in terms of they're the, they're big enough now that they're not going to grow their market. So they, I think they have to do something to kind of maintain the situation. And you know, Sam is a smart enough businessman. I think that he's savvy enough to realize that his future may not be. 
um, set. Yeah. So he needs to get that three hundred million dollars, dump it back into the company, and at least have it out if the time comes. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and I I see that, but I that, you know I was just thinking, well, who's at the plate and needing to gain? And I'm amazed Sam Adams hasn't you know pulled the trigger on merging or buying somebody. You know, not like a thirteen, but maybe like a. 25 or 42 well, this, you know and this might be the start of it you know this might give them enough traction to to do something like that because i mean they you know they've already you know they make spike seltzer they yeah. make a uh, cider beers you know they have all these other things that they're in the game with and now they kind of have some in something with with dogfish head which Really, what surprised me more is the fact that they picked somebody so close to them. Yeah. I mean, you know, Delaware is not that far from Boston. Oh, yeah. So it, it seemed kind of strange to me that they picked someplace so close and didn't go, you know, farther west or even farther, yeah, you know, farther like south. A, like a West Coast beer, you know, wow. like, a, uh, you know, Hopworks or, you know, something. I don't know. Like I'm trying to think of what, like Deschutes. That would been like right? that would yeah. been like a major new story right yeah. there, you know, yeah. Sam Adams and Deschutes merging or something like that. Yeah. So and just so you have those, and you're right, like it's East Coast, East Coast. Like, okay, what are you guys benefiting? You're already in the same footprint, right? And um, both distributing nationwide. Yeah. So it's not like to me they're not to me. Dogfish Head is gaining more from this than Boston Beer Company is. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know what direction this really takes Boston Beer in. Maybe it's more, you know, the innovative brewing that the the brewers have at Dogfish Head. Maybe that's what they're hoping to get to make right. maybe more of their seasonals, you know, stand out a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, because they definitely make some unique beers at Dogfish Head. So, yeah. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see. Sam um, basically said that he's going to take a majority of the money and dump it back into the company and then all the stock um options that he got as part of the deal he's going to turn that into a foundation um you know a charity charitable foundation so i don't know i mean it, to me it really just seems like this was his out like this granted he's still going to be part of the company he's still going to be the head brewer but i think that uh Really, what he's done is he's positioned himself to be able to just say, "I'm walking away from it." Yeah. When the time comes. Yeah, maybe he's like, "It's not my company anymore. I have my retirement fund that I, right. you know, built." And maybe that's what he was looking at. Is like, "Oh crap!" You know, um, with all these other breweries, and especially in you know the Northeast, you got a lot of freaking competition. Yeah. That he is like, okay, it's either you know open another brewery like you've seen so many places do a second location maybe on the west coast or maybe in colorado or you know portland right but then he's like well look at what happened to green flash when they opened their second location look at you know they eventually have to close it down so that might have scared him a little bit and he's like okay maybe i just need a and not really maybe he didn't want to sell out to big beer but he's selling out to close to big beer right, you know right yeah so. yeah it's i mean I don't know. I guess we'll just have to see what what happens. I honestly, I don't think anything's going to change. I think they're just going to remain Dogfish Head and Boston Beer Company. They're going to keep doing their thing, except now their you know their profits all go to one place. Yeah, I, that's really all I think is going to come out of it. I don't think again. I don't think anybody gains from this deal. Yeah, yeah. So, so. it's kind of interesting. But um, Denver uh, also decriminalized mushrooms. So we. Which basically now you just get a ticket if you get caught with mushrooms instead of a ticket going, instead of going to jail <laughs> and, instead of just give me the rest of your mushrooms man. <laughs> okay, officer. <laughs> and it's just Denver, which Denver yeah. like actual city limits really isn't that big. <laughs> so like I don't all I'm, those five people that are homeless that are on mushrooms anyways. Right, you're not going to jail. <laughs> I uh I don't get it. I don't even understand what the initiative was all about. Like, yeah, it kind of just popped up out of nowhere. Like I'm like, we we're voting. Like people were voting on this. Yeah, I mean, whatever. It 
it's Denver. They they it led you know the same type of thing led the way for marijuana to get yeah, basically legalized in Colorado. It started out being decriminalized, and then went to medical. Medical. And then, but I don't really know the medical benefits of mushrooms. <sighs> there are none, really. <laughs> like, I mean, it's... like I rubbed it on joints, and then it didn't really do anything, so I just <laughs> ate them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it did something. <laughs> yeah, my pain was still there. But I could really feel it. <laughs> like, I don't know. Yeah. There's nothing else, you know. Yeah. I, and honestly, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I, I like mushrooms as much as the next guy, but I really don't care whether or not they're decriminalized yeah. or not. I mean, usually when I get them, I eat them before there's ever a chance for me to get caught with them. So. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got there, son? <laughs> <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Big giant purple dragon. <laughs> That's pretty much how it goes. <laughs> when did I get to Las Vegas? <laughs> Which is a great place to eat mushrooms oh, yeah. if you haven't. It's a fantastic place to eat mushrooms. <laughs> what is Matt doing? Don't worry, he's on mushrooms. <laughs> Where's he going? Don't worry. Don't worry. He's on his own journey. He's on his own quest. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, you know, today we have another interview, man. We've had this great run of some fantastic interviews with local uh, local breweries, and this one is one that I've been eager for for a while. Yeah. Um, I don't know what's taken so long for us to to lock them down, but um, we pretty much interviewed everybody else that works for them. Yeah. So we, <laughs> you know, we've had three, two or three different people that yeah. work at Weldworks on our show, and we finally get, um, we finally locked down Neil and and Colin and um, some others, and um, it's it's technically the interview hasn't actually happened yet. This is before the interview. So but this is a precast of the interview. This is, a, this is a we're talking about the interview before it's actually happened. Yeah. But. Uh, um, it's, I'm excited for it, man. Oh yeah. 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 I think this is one of those things we kept, I mean, about the time they're what already a year or two in when we started our podcast and we did, it, it was just like, there were always a conversation, you know, there was always, oh man, they're, they're doing this. Oh, they, did you see that they're releasing this and they're pretty much the beer shorts or, oh, you know, when we had those and then the beer battles. Yeah. They're always part of it because we wanted to see if they were, you know, everybody was craving over them and we wanted to see if they could hold up against right. other breweries. So, yeah. um, but it was also nice because they're right in our backyard. Yeah. I mean, it's great having Weldworks here to have a, a brewery that's got so much national attention and has really been making a splash in the brewing world and have them right here in our backyard is, is a pretty cool you know, there's fantastic breweries in Denver that are doing the same thing and, you know, out of range in Breckenridge. Mm -hmm. But to have a little piece of that here in northern Colorado is is pretty awesome. Oh, yeah. And it, we're lucky to have that. Um, but it's also kind of a pain in the ass sometimes. Oh, yeah. You when, know? Especially you want to just go down there and have a, a nice beer on a Friday afternoon and you have to stand in line. <laughs> Right, or you're, you're like, what is everybody here the, for? Your spot at the bar is is taken by <laughs> ten people, but uh, yeah, I um, you know, I'm, I'd like to. We we definitely have to thank um, thank Shea at Radcraft because you know we've we've pushed for this interview several times, but I think she's really the one that got made it happen for us mainly just by putting it out there. Hey, these guys want to interview for you. Yeah, contact them. And uh, so I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks, Shay. And she's actually doubted us out with other stuff. If you don't yeah. know, like um, maybe we shouldn't say what stuff she's helped us out with, <laughs> but she's gotten a lot of uh, the collaboration stuff, all the info to us for that. So we appreciate that. Keep you guys updated on what's coming out. Um, she updates us, and we update you. So yeah, yeah, we appreciate uh, we appreciate everything that she's been doing to help us. Um, lock down some of these great interviews that we've been getting. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we're going to learn a lot about Weldworks and the future of Weldworks. And, you know, I, I, I have some really great questions that I've always wanted to ask Neil and Colin and just kind of, hopefully I get some straight answers from them. Ask them if they've really ever put their finger in the bunghole. <laughs> 
<laughs> and tasted the mini noche on the other side. <laughs> they probably have. <laughs> All right, so here is our interview with Weldworks Gang. <laughs> Hopheads and Beard Geeks, Reber here to tell you about Beards by Nick. Beards by Nick makes all of the great products you need to get your beard looking great. Everything from beard wash, mustache wax, beard oil, beard combs, and even beard wipes. Beards by Nick products are handcrafted using only the finest ingredients, and it's all done right here in Northern Colorado. Go to beardsbynick.com, B E E R D S beardsbynick.com. Use the promo code GALAXYHOPS at checkout. Where did this all start? How did how did Weldworks come about? Neil's garage. Yeah, we uh, we like just like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs started in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be a movie one day, I hope. <laughs> I get to determine who plays us, but be a really quick movie. Oh, yeah, <laughs> pretty short. I get but, Matthew uh, McConaughey. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, but we yeah, I I was uh, homebrewing. Probably started in 2009, 2000, end of 2009, um, so about a year after I moved to Colorado. Wow. And then very quickly, I'm, I don't know if I am just afraid of being alone, but I can't do anything by myself. I, I have to like <laughs> include everyone on something like that. So um, it wasn't long before a few buddies, um, specifically uh, Colin's neighbor Dan, introduced us and then we had 10 or 15 guys that were just kind of showing up on Saturdays uh, to brew and drink and hang out and did festivals and brewery tours and all that kind of stuff together. It was almost an informal homebrew club mm-hmm. and that's where Colin and I met and we had been doing that for a few years with really not any serious ambitions of opening a brewery but I think just like any homebrew group of friends that you know that drink for free and don't pay for beer they're like you should open a brewery so um, <laughs> we kind of had this longer discussion about okay if we can win at a a more you know a bigger more regional competition than just the local stuff then we'd start talking about it more seriously so in january 2014 we took our first medals at uh the big beers competition which is another reason why big beers is such a big festival for us yeah um so that year we took two or three medals i think it was three three. yeah and then so two sours one stout um and then that kind of is what prompted Colin and I to, to talk more seriously. And Colin, you know, was like, we sh- we can make this happen if um, we've got the right people and right kind of opportunities in place. And sure enough, we did about, uh, we started really in earnest on the business plan in March of 2014 and then opened our doors here in February, 2015. So um, it was pretty quick from inception to, to kind of launching, but um, it'd been in the back of our minds a little bit. We had kind of run through some options of what we do. This space was a big factor in that, you know, mm-hmm. um, just being able to, to, one, lease it, and then obviously the option to purchase down the road. But um, we kind of, we knew we wanted to be downtown. We knew we wanted a, a space that was big enough to grow into. So there's just a lot of factors and, and the right people coming in, finding Kristen, finding um, friends and family that were willing to help for, for free, essentially, for a little while, um, just to get us off the ground and then continue to invest in, in all that. And, and then the community of Greeley. So yeah. just a lot of puzzle pieces that all just kind of, happened to fit at the right time and here we are a little over four years later and it's kind of crazy yeah it's been uh you know just seeing the growth i i was here on the first day and to see um you know to see how much it's changed the building has changed the the people have changed the beers have changed um that growth has been really exciting to see for the community and how 
how much has your involvement in the community driven some of that that uh, behavior and growth we haven't you know i think i think it all kind of culminated we were it was just right place right time we we weren't the ones driving downtown growth not yeah. the only ones there's plenty of other businesses um i think we do get a lot of you know especially in the craft beer community a lot of people think of like oh i never came to Greeley before now i'm coming on a regular basis obviously wiley roots is sure. just down the road from us and so there's more of a craft beer destination but beyond what's happening in the craft beer scene there's been tons of growth specifically in downtown we've got three major projects happening on 8th avenue big development projects our first residential projects which are in the last you know five years that are much needed for bringing some some actual living downtown um, but there's a lot of businesses that have been investing for a lot longer than us into this area in this corridor of 8th ave um, we just we get it's sexy beer is really fun and it's easy to to connect with right i think and so um, we get some of the credit that we don't deserve and then a lot that we do um, and so i think it's just been a fun opportunity to see even since we talked about opening five years ago downtown Greeley has transformed drastically sure um, and and i think it's still overall Greeley still growing at a fairly um fairly rapid pace just because of a lot of factors i think it's location you know we're a little bit outside of the 25 corridor but still close enough and then uh cost of living you know it's still affordable homes for first-time home buyers and, and young families and so i think we're going to continue to see growth in Greeley, and that's you know we just got in really at the perfect time yeah um and so we kind of rode this wave and um, it's fun to see even new restaurants coming in downtown some of our you know our favorites like luna's um, seeing what Brian and, and Eli are doing and, and Sam and everybody. it's There's just so much cool, you know, I think most people, the invitation last year was a really good indicator. A lot of people had never spent more than a few hours here in Greeley and then came to the Invitational, maybe walked around and saw some businesses. And, um, you know, it's it's not downtown. It's not Old Town, Fort Con, you know, it's not Fort Collins. It's not downtown Denver. It's not trying to be either. I think it's it's it's, it's totally own entity, own identity. And we're just excited to be a part of that yeah. conversation. You know, I think really the point that I, I was leaning towards was um, I sat here one day um, at my normal spot at the bar and was talking to a guy. And it was after one of your first um, Juicy Bitch releases. And the guy leaned over to me and he goes, where are all these people coming from? Greeley's not that big. What's going on? And I said, <laughs> well, Weldworks just introduced, like, craft beer geeks to Greeley. Um, you know, Wiley Roots had done a really good job of making some great, interesting beers. Um, but, you know, the, the explosion of Juicy Bits, I think, is really when Greeley saw this, like, influx of people coming this direction. Did you guys see that? I mean, when, when you released Juicy Bits, were you like, this is what's going to bring the, you know, I don't bring think, all the hopheads to the yard. I don't think we saw it <laughs> until we were pulling up for our first anniversary, and it's like, oh, there's about 300 people in line. Like, where yeah. am I at? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what <laughs> the hell? <laughs> if we had known that, we would have just opened with Juicy Bits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Slam dunk. Yeah. I, I just found it interesting, you know, I mean, the guy sitting next to me, I talked to him numerous times sitting at the bar, and his he was just dumbfounded but where are all these people coming from what's yeah. going on here well and we, we wear that with a badge of pride uh in in my opinion uh we are pretty humble and low-key just like our city is we're not trying sure. to be hyper cool we're not trying to locate in areas that are hyper cool um i'm sure we could hang there uh we've we've got a very good marketing presence and we're very strategic and and thoughtful about uh those kind of moves but we like having a chip on our shoulder and Sure. Kind of being from uh, an agricultural town, uh, you are constantly struggling for those visitors. And we have a lot of different uh, issues that come around from that. Mm-hmm. We don't have the foot traffic of a rhino or an old town or anything like that. And so what are other ways that we can be start to become a more of a destination brewery? How can we keep people up here longer? How can we make their stay more enjoyable? Uh, we're having to be a lot more thoughtful than I think we would have to otherwise because we're not gifted the foot traffic of people just being able to walk down the street and get here. We know they are driving or flying many times sure. uh, hours to, to get here. Mm-hmm. And, we, and we understand that. And uh, I feel like we really take that to heart and, and really try to create a space and environment in, in selection that really keeps them uh, happy that they made that that travel. 
and it's it's got to be tough to balance between that and maintaining a connection with the people who really are the community i mean i just finished drinking your lager and it's not a beer that you've had on tap much in the last couple of years so i mean is that just the direction towards trying to keep that connection or you know i, mean, I that to me is just uh we like to brew what we like to drink right um and so it's not going to be just all hazy ipas and, and noche um we're going to keep a, a pretty good mix of, of selection because that's what we enjoy yeah um we like going to restaurants that have seasonal menus that are constantly being refreshed and uh, that are appropriate for the the time in, in the season um, and then come back the next week and see something new and, and we really try to play that uh, as well and be crafted and be uh, thoughtful um, but have a good selection for everybody uh, Hef is still our biggest seller here in the Greeley Tap Room Absolutely. Um, uh, from a draft standpoint so uh, that's not going to be the case on any of our uh, off-prem accounts or most of our off-prem accounts but uh, that's still the big leader here, and I think that does show that uh, the local community uh, is still very much enamored by us and, and continues to visit, mm -hmm. despite the influx from, from Denver and beyond. So We spoke a little bit about Juicy Bits, and there have been um, numerous different versions of that beer, and uh, um, it's, it's, a, I mean, it's a great base to make interesting IPAs from. What's um, what do you think makes that so special? You know, I think it took us better part of three or four months to really decide what we wanted to to launch with a New England IPA. Um, we kind of really started tasting them in the end of 2015, so kind of before our one year October. We had some friends, Jamie Bogner at Craft Beer and Brewing, and and Adam, one of our uh, our tap room servers, and some other friends that had been kind of pushing us in that direction, saying. You guys got to try a, your hand at this because we were pretty adept with other hops and IPAs and things, but had never really gone to to a, a true New England style. And so, tasting I don't know, close to fifty or, or more different examples across the country, we got to really know what the style was, you know, what made it unique and what made each kind of iteration different. And then from that, we kind of decided where we wanted to land, and it was pretty pointed. We wanted to be really fruit forward on the hop varietals so you know mimicking juice without actually adding fruit um, we wanted a little bit lower bitterness for that reason as well to be more expressive with the hops and then we still wanted something really creamy without being too cloying so we wanted kind of that middle ground of attenuation and so that's kind of where we designed the recipe and that's where it took us and it was one of the few beers that we, i mean we've tweaked it here and there to try and improve just process things but Recipe wise, we've made very little changes to that beer since we introduced it, which is remarkable. You know, we've never changed the, the hops. Um, we get different years, so we obviously have the latest Citra, the latest Mosaic, and the latest El Dorado in that. Um, but that one to one to one ratio of Mosaic, Citra, El Dorado, we've never changed, which is is kind of crazy that we haven't. You know, um, yet at some point you kind of think people will get kind of tired of that flavor profile, and, and it just seems to have staying power for whatever reason. Um, but I think for those reasons, the kind of way we designed it with a little bit lower bitterness um, makes it appeal to a, a broader audience. Um, so pop heads that have traditionally liked West Coast kind of bitter IPAs still like it because it's really bright and just tons of hop character because of our hop rates. Um, but people that maybe, you know, we always have fun anecdotes about how many people come in, don't want an IPA, say they hate IPAs, we pour them juicy bits, don't tell them it's an IPA. They love it, and then yeah. they start drinking Juicy Bits. So yeah. it's a totally different crowd, which is cool. Um, but it also is just a great base to, to kind of riff on and, and bring in double dry hop variants and, you know, the double IPA version, extra, extra. Um, it just is a, it's a pretty good starting point. So yeah. um, we've we kind of played with it, I think, a little too much when we were doing Fruity Bits, and we were kind of using that name on almost everything. Now we've kind of reserved it just for basically the Mosaic Citra Eldorado prototype of our take on New England IPA and, and I think that's helped a lot for us just to know how that's different than our other milkshake IPAs that used to be fruity bits but they had nothing really to do with juicy bits they were totally different beers last year the hundred and hundred plus beers um, I'm sure you guys have gotten a lot of questions about that but I, I've always been curious when was when that was brought up in a meeting who brought it up and at what point did somebody go you're nuts Jake, <laughs> everybody's, everybody's looking at you. <laughs> you know, I, 
it was just kind of a, a dawning realization of, uh, amongst all of us that it was something that we we could do and um to to both kind of neil's and colin's points one of the strengths that we've had especially in the past couple of years is a really acute awareness of what we don't know by which i mean you know we you, you say to to some folks that yeah we're gonna package and distribute 100 beers in a year you know most people look at you like you got bugs crawling out of your ears to a certain degree but you know we didn't we knew that we had built we knew we had a good infrastructure we knew that we had the back of house that could pull it off and we just kind of believe that like why not like let's, sure. let's, let's throw, throw a dart at the wall and see if it sticks and if it does then we can look back at the end of the year and say holy christmas we did this like we really pulled it off. So it, there was never a sense of trepidation. There was never a sense of, oh man, like well, what, what did we get ourselves into now? It was, um, it's, it's kind of like a kid in a sandbox to a certain degree. Like you're, you're, you're not, you don't have any particular thing in mind. You're just kind of going what if and seeing what comes out of the, the idea of not really having any boundaries on you and not really having to worry about uh, a lot of the other constraints that that some some spots may have. So I I think I, at, at that point the the genesis of it was just kind of as much as we loved Sleeping Giant, who we were uh, contract brewing with at that point, we knew that the beers that were on the shelves weren't what people were really excited about Weldworks for. It was our Hefeweizen and our um, our Vienna Lager, and I think we had a, a hazy on the shelves at that point and uh, a stout, but they weren't they weren't the types of things that people were coming out here and lining up for. And so it's like, well, shoot, we, we can, we can figure out a way to get these beers. We got, we got a mobile canner kind of who's new, new to the scene who can get us in. What do you guys think? Do we, and I, I don't know if it was any one particular person's idea. It definitely wasn't a hundred beers in a year or anything like that. That wasn't, that wasn't yeah. the start of it. It was at the end of a meeting. It was like 20 minutes that we're just like, <laughs> you, know, you know what would be funny guys. <laughs> and you know, and it just grew organically from there. And so what last year ended up being. So, yeah, you know, we're not, we're not afraid to taste, take those risks and we're not afraid to just kind of throw the playbook out a little bit and see, see if we can, pull it off both because it's fun uh and because it stretches us and because it it challenges us and uh it creates something for all the staff to get behind it creates something for us to be proud of and for all the staff to be proud of to like go to their go to their the, the people that they know that know well to be like look at what we're doing check this out and so uh it just seemed like it just fit there was just like a good comfortable fit like i don't know it's weird maybe it's going to be terrible but let's give it a shot and see what happens what I really enjoyed was the uh, to to Jake's point the the stress that that put on all of the the operations to that point. So from uh, sales and logistics, going to our biggest accounts and saying, not only are we doing sixteen ounce can four packs, but they're priced at X amount, and you're not going to be able to get it the next week. <laughs> How do we sell it? We don't know. We'll do whatever we need to do to support you, but we don't know. And well, let's see how it goes. Let's give it a couple of weeks. Okay. Yep. Just keep uh, whatever you're, you're delivering. Just deliver it. Give me my full allocation. Like here we go. They're yeah. having fun. Uh, so it, I, we really love changing the the models and flipping the the paradigms. Um, but from sales logistics to to brew house, can you imagine the ingredient ordering process and how that needs to be fine tuned to to execute that? The brew schedules, the brewers. Uh, the taproom staff needing to be constantly trained on every week's new beers that are constantly coming out and being able to expertly talk to those to those points. It really forced us to, to really gin up all of our process, procedures, education, knowledge, creativity, communication, especially communication, uh, all of these systems to, to support that endeavor. But what it built was amazing. Yeah. And, and, it, and really, truly propelled us to the next level of, of growth uh, that, you know, we're soaking it in, um, we'll, but we'll be able to execute pretty damn near anything that we want to set our eyes to. So, yeah. Acquisitions of property, staff, development, the way we run our business, the way we do sales, the way we do, I mean, almost anything that we do, um, we kind of go at it with kind of fresh eyes, brand new perspective and saying like, what's 
we were to start over from scratch with this today, what would what would we do? And we do that with almost every system we try. Right. Um, so, I think, I think, I think the only reason we're willing to take that many risks is because we have built into all that some That's sort right. of calculation of potential failure. Um, hope we don't, but we're not afraid of it. And we will, like you said, le lessons learned. Anything we do, any missteps we take, we'll learn from them and, and do better the next time. Yeah. So. yeah. A lot of that's ba uh, team based too. We've uh, been able to really create a team that has been able to support all these big leaps. Um, we've not always executed it, but we always really do attempt to staff our teams to take the next jump and not just satisfy where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. Give us a little bit of headspace to kind of keep our heads in the clouds and, and be able to ponder what are those next steps and and to not be so saturated with the day-to-day -day that uh, we can't ever look forward. So we've always been uh, pretty keen on strategy uh, and really trying to distill that within our teams. And uh, it's a work in progress. We, we've absolutely had failures, uh, and we do great post-ops, like, hey, what happened? Where did this go wrong? How did that decision get made? Who was in charge? And all that sort of stuff, and deconstruct that and really make it a teachable moment. Uh, mm -hmm. But to Neil's point, we, we love failure. We're not going to get to the next level unless we uh, fail uh, and we're okay failing on, on every uh, uh, ground, but let's just not repeat them. Right, yeah. yeah. And it was, it was fun as a craft beer drinker and someone here locally to see it and to also have the option of, yeah, that one doesn't really sound that great to me, but, you know, there's a lot of, there's plenty of taps there for me to stop by and have something that I do enjoy, so. Yep. Um, it was uh, it was it was fun to watch, and I, I coming into this year, I was like, all right, well, they did a hundred plus last year. What's this year going to look like? And uh, pleasantly surprised to see that you guys didn't go and and try and do it again because then it just feels like you're trying to, you know, piggyback on 150 new beers <laughs> a year, 200 beers, one million new beers. <laughs> Probably won't be far off from 100 this year. They won't be. Yeah. It's but, be pretty close. Yeah. yeah. But it's also not something that you know. At some point, there was some pressure last year. Like, well, we gotta make sure we hit 100. So, and then it just got, you know, the train had been full steam ahead, and so we blazed through 100, 100 by GABF and 130, yeah, 138 by the yeah. end of the year. Um, so this year it won't be that far off, but it's more, I think the, the approach is different. It's, you know, we're still experimenting. We're still, I mean, innovation is probably going to be one of the, it's going to be paramount to all works forever. Um, and as soon as we stop doing that, we'll, we'll start to, to lose a little bit of who we are, but it doesn't mean we can't also fine tune it. That's kind of our, it's, it's been on our cans for a bit longer, but that's kind of more of what we're approaching this year is fine tuned beer and, and fine tuning everything really process and stability yeah. and. Um, so we can still approach it with, you know, we can introduce beers like lager that are, you know, a version of our Keller Pills. Um, we're not as constrained by we have to have, you know, 17 different styles we take on this year and 15 iterations of those or whatever. So, yeah. yeah. So um, a question that uh, one of we're, our, uh, our group of patrons, our paid subscribers, is called the Hopheads and Beer Geeks. And one of the questions that they asked me to ask you guys is, what is the difference between media noche and acromatic? Mm, good question. It's a great question. <clears throat> so they're pretty, uh, they're fundamentally different. They're both imperial stouts. Um, media noche technically predates acromatic because we started filling, filling bourbon barrels before we started releasing non barrel aged imperial stouts. So within a month of us opening, we were filling our first batch of barrels of Media Noche. And the recipe's obviously been improved just from what we've learned about aging and everything else. But that same recipe was designed from the ground up as a barrel aged imperial stout. So we always get questions like, will you guys ever put out just base Media Noche and not in the barrel? And the answer is no, because that beer doesn't exist. There's no such thing as Media Noche is incomplete without both time and barrel. It's part of the core ingredient to that beer. So we design the, the, the recipe accordingly, whether it's bitterness or roast or attenuation or all the factors that allow us to go up to 18 months in barrels or longer, those are all baked into that recipe. And so we don't ever really, you know, we, we taste it along the way to, to know how it's aging, but we would never put it out because it's just not, it's not a good beer, to be honest, yeah. on its own. It's, mis it's, it'd be like making an IPA without the hops, just as it's not itself. 
Um, Acromatic was designed with a similar intent. It was not designed as just our base Imperial Stout. It was meant to be an adjuncted stout. So it was meant to be sort of a base baseline recipe that could have chocolate and coffee and coconut and maple and all the adjuncts under the sun. And that's kind of what that, that beer was initially designed for. So it was kind of the end of our, I think end of 2015, we started doing, I think it started with chocolate acromatic. So fall of 2015 probably is when we introduced chocolate acromatic. Um, we've never to date released just straight acromatic. We've had questions for that as well. Are you ever just going to release the base Imperial stout, no adjuncts? And the answer is the same. It's that beer was designed for adjuncts. We adjust the recipe according to which adjuncts we're using. So if we're using coffee, we dial back the roast malts quite a bit to, because we know we're going to get a lot of roast from that coffee. Um, if we're doing, you know, something with a little bit more candy sweetness, we'll maybe dial back the, the caramel and crystal malts. So that was the idea behind that acromatic base beer. We, we still use it in coffee maple, but that also brought up an issue in the last six months to a year that we said, okay, maybe it's time for a refresh to introduce a new Imperial stout, design the recipe from the ground up, but knowing that we're going to be leaning more into a, a milk stout, more pastry. So not just adjuncts, um, maybe a little bit less balanced, you know, acromatics, not super balanced, but there's, you know, I would say compared to what we've started doing in the last year or two, it's not quite as dessert like it's more, um, kind of adjunct, but adjunct driven, but not, totally adjunct forward and right. a lot of our other stouts are, are more pastry inspired stouts are definitely more adjunct forward and, and that's when we kind of designed the, the base beer we call it our imperial milk stout base um, we've used it in fluffer nutter and um, pudgy grams uh, we've got some more in the works too so um, not uh, you know a complete from the ground up rework but essentially kind of a, a restart of an imperial stout meant for adjuncts but with kind of that milk stout base in mind, so lactose and sure. Um, but yeah, that they're you know they obviously we use a lot of the same malts in some of these beers, but they're designed around that purpose. So they're very intentional on the recipe design. Um, there's lots of ways that other people do that, where they just develop a really good imperial stout and then do it with adjuncts and do it with barrels, and that that works great for a lot of people. But for us and what we wanted to do, we had a pretty clear vision that we wanted to produce a, a imperial stout that exhibits as much barrel character as we can get in but still has enough stout to hold up and that's where midi noche was and the same with acromatic and adjuncts yeah so. uh, one of the other questions we had from our um, hotbeds and beer geeks were as home brewers how can they get that um that same type of body and mouthfeel in their stouts that that both midi noche and acromatic have a fantastic Mouthfeel, so. How long can your gas last for? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was a, I didn't Buy remember. extra propane, is that what you're saying? There's a new, uh, new, in the latest Emergy, there's a long boil article basically trying to, uh, I think, debunk a little bit of the long boils. and um, I haven't read it yet. I should read it. Um, that would be the first thing, the yeah. boil. Just boil the Com- hell out com- of it. Yeah, I mean, we, <laughs> we boil 32 to 36 hours on Midi Noche and around six hours for Acromatic and maybe longer, depending on the base. Um and that's, I don't know, that's, there's a lot of questions. Is, is that even worth the, the time and the effort and the sure. cost? And I think there's probably other ways around it, whether it's malt extract or dextrose. But for us, for, for those two lines, we kind of, or specifically for Midi Noche, we, we really don't want to use anything other than just malt. So all the sugars just derive from malt. So the only way to go from 30, 31 Play-Doh to 37 to 38 Play-Doh is to continue to boil it. There's, you know, can't squeeze more gravity than is available in the malt, so you got to reduce it. And so that's kind of the, been the approach. But that, the reason for that is that attenu- that it's not purposely under attenuated, but it does reach its attenuation. Whatever we have left is what kind of contributes to that body and mouthfeel. Sure. Um, I would say oats. We we use a, a fair amount of oats in most of our stouts, um, and even in some of the milk stouts we do. Lactose definitely adds body, but oats add a different kind of mouthfeel. And so we we use oats, oats in most of our IPAs, too. So flaked oats is probably one of our, our top uh, specialty ingredients in almost uh, you know 60% of our beers. Yeah. Um, just because of that mouthfeel component without a cloying sweetness you sometimes get from lactose. So I'd say if you're designing an imperial stout, uh, if I was brewing at home, I don't think I'd make one without at least 10% oats. Yeah, great. I know you guys are limited on time, and I want to get into um, I want to get into Invitational because that's coming up. Um, 
tell us, uh, tell me a little bit about Invitational, where the idea came from. Kristen, uh, I have a feeling that you have a lot to do with this. So, um, and and what we're in store for this year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's kind of been, uh, at least for Neil and I, um, for years now, that had been a, a major dream for us to do, not only because is it just a super fun, awesome undertaking, but uh, the impact that it would have on the community, um, being able to hold an event that would raise uh, what turned out to be our first year, $40,000, uh, that we got to distribute to some of our um, nonprofits up here, but also, you know, bringing... 1,200 people, 1,300 people to Greeley for full weekend, I mean, really immersing them in the community and seeing what we have to offer up here, uh, that was the dream. That was really what sparked the entire idea. And uh, Jake's been on board helping with the planning, too, and the three of us were able to just dream really big and cultivate an amazing uh, list of breweries attending, fantastic pour list. Um, and just a really cool experience all the way around, both for our guests and our uh, brewers that we host for the weekend. Um, and this year, it, last year was wildly successful. Like it, it really, it beat out anything we had hoped for and we were so proud and excited about it. And uh, this year it's kind of just repeat and do better. Um, we uh, have a lot of the same amazing breweries coming back. We have a lot of really cool new additions. Um, poor list is starting to come together. It's looking fantastic. We got some really neat ideas on how to elevate the atmosphere uh, over at the venue um, and up our game in hospitality for the brewers as well. That's awesome. It was a, you know, I, I missed out last year. I, it just happened to fall on the weekend of my wife's birthday. And for her birthday, it's her birthday. And that's, there's <laughs> not no, going to a there's, brew fest. we're not going to a brew fest. Oh, I got you. <laughs> so, um, but I heard nothing but good things. And, you know, what makes inv- Invitational so special, really? I mean, what's what I'm, makes it different than other beer festivals, I guess? I mean, I don't know how other beer festivals are planned and executed, but the amount of time and brain power that we pour into every last detail is pretty exhausting. Um, we got an amazing committee of... Uh, uh, volunteer heads, kind of um, the old homebrew club from uh, Neil's early days, um, just coming together to help us think through every last detail down to, um, you know, how do we get people in the door in four minutes, which we did. And second session, we actually got, what was it, 600 people in two and a half minutes through the door and on <laughs> so, the floor and amazing. in line. Yeah, it was Did you use cattle kind of prods? Or? <laughs> I mean, I know that uh, front, you know, Greeley, tra- <laughs> Greeley Stampede was going on that same weekend. So. Yeah, <laughs> right. those, it was cool. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, just the, every last attention to detail. We planned this for six months out of the year, and we just put ourselves in the shoes of every attendee and every brewer, and uh, yeah, it, it, it comes out to be pretty amazing and pretty special, and, and that's pretty much it, just just a lot of uh, intentionality. And, and I think what people don't realize about Invitational is it's, uh, I mean, everything goes to charity, right? You're not doing yeah. this for, for profit. 100%, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So I think that's what makes it, makes it special. And I, I heard a lot of people talking about the cost, and I was one of them, I'm not going to lie. I was one of the people <laughs> that talked about the cost of the ticket. Um, but when you, you see that there's so many unique beers and um, the fact that it does all go to charity it really does make it, make it a different event. And the cost doesn't seem so, so exceptional in that matter. But yeah, we um, hope so. You know, it's a, it's a real cool special event, not just for the attendees and for us and for the brewers. But again, it, it's all about the community. Yeah, and even that, even the the price point, we would including a lot of the things that we pulled from hospitality wise, setup wise, etc. You know, it it comes from picking apart the festivals that we've been lucky enough to be a part of over the past couple of years. And, um, you know, Colin, Colin likes to use the, the phrase, you know, gotta, gotta do our R and D. Oh yeah. <laughs> gotta rip, rip off and rip duplicate. Off and duplicate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there's, you know, clearly the Invitational is not the first beer festival, awesome beer festival that's ever been thrown. We're standing right. on the shoulders of people who have been executing this type of stuff for years and years and years. And even just some of the newer ones, like Forever Summer at the Vale and, um, you know, Burial's Burn Pile, where yeah, they just kind of, they, they turn all of the dials to 11. And uh, and when you do that, it just, just costs a little 
bit extra in order just to make sure that everything is is just right and in the right place. And of course, the the, the charity uh, aspect helps as well. But we we pulled that even just from those those folks who are have been knocking it out of the park for years sure. as well. So. Can we? Uh are, can we have any teasers of tap list or <laughs> so are um, you holding that all very close to you to you <laughs> yeah it's, it's it, the only reason being is that uh the, the brewers technically don't have to have their list in until next friday um you know we know how hard it can be to always be projecting out you know three months in advance maybe even we, just to yeah i mean we are getting that question to us for festivals we're attending and we can't we can't say for sure and again to your point we don't we want to be cognizant of what how that impacts those other brewers especially super small ones that are sub a thousand barrels a year their product is in tight supply so they need to make a last minute decision and i'm glad we accommodate them yeah yeah i I guess one of the things that we could probably mention here that we haven't put out on uh onto Social media is that uh, we we did we did toss in one last brewery that hasn't uh, I don't has been officially announced but um, other half from Brooklyn will be coming out to hang out as well and awesome. uh, sending uh, sending a couple a couple few pretty pretty bomb beers to uh, we've become really good friends with those cats over the over the past handful of months and ever since GABF really and so we're stoked to have them out here as well. Great. Great. Well, that was a very politically correct way of saying no. You're not going to give me any information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, truly. The w- there will be many no chairs. Yes. Exactly. Well, the works will be there. <laughs> yep. We are pouring juicy bits. Too. You know, and I, I did want to kind of solidify that point that you made about uh, all of it going to charity. So we actually spun up a whole nonprofit arm called the Waldworks Community Foundation, which is an actual 501c3 uh, entity. And we have separate books, the whole nine yards. This entity puts on that festival. Weldworks is just a participant and probably will be a a primary sponsor uh, this year, again, to just kind of keep some good cash uh, flowing to the uh, community charities and uh, uh, underwrite some of the administrative costs of of putting this festival on. But, uh, yeah, we did just, again, just to give everybody, attendees to participating breweries and the community and everything else, just peace of mind to that 100% 100% is actually going to charity. It's it's in the books. Uh, we don't cheat. We don't keep any money back for Weldworks Brewing and underwrite our brewing costs. Nothing like that whatsoever. So it's all on the up and up, and uh, we're really proud to do it the, the right way. That's great. It's, a, it's an awesome way to, to keep recognizing the community and, and go give back to the community as well. So, yep. um, your recent purchase of this city block, what was behind your decision to keep it here in the original location as opposed to building a whole new location? Well, to Neil's earlier point, we were dedicated to downtown Greeley. There really wasn't any other place for us. Um, we felt Greeley was uh, incredibly underserved uh, at that time. Uh, I still think, uh, personally, Greeley still underserved quite a bit in comparison to other markets. Um, and we again personally i like when i go into a town i go downtown whether that's downtown denver and the surrounding areas like rhino and things like that Mm -hmm. fort collins i'm in old town or a little bit north or uh, a little bit uh, east Um, that's just where we hang usually we go to that city center and we and again to neil's earlier point we wanted to to really raise the status of greeley city center as much as we could um there's still kind of a division line even here within town of Westsiders not really wanting to come to the east side. And, oh, downtown, that's scary. That's not safe. And, I mean, we haven't had any issues here in, in our four, um, four and a half years in, of existence here. Um, it's a very safe place, and it's very, very cool. I love bringing up friends uh, from Denver, and they're just like, holy cow, like Greeley's actually kind of got a lot going on yeah it's like yeah we do you and know there's no cows walking down the street exactly right <laughs> just don't tell anybody <laughs> you know in the smell thing uh i and i do i sometimes you can get used to it i used to live a, a, across from a feedlot uh, in clovis new mexico and it was atrocious and you never got used to that but i do understand that you can get used to it and so i always uh, uh check myself with with my guests and say is there a smell today <laughs> they're like never like yeah. not one of them has ever said like yeah there, there's a smell today and and that's progress you know that's that's those are towns turning from agricultural centers into more kind of uh, uh community uh hubs and so the 
more houses get built, uh, the feedlots get moved out and everything else. When I first moved to Colorado, Longmont smelled like just the worst smell ever. Yeah. And with the boulder growth and everything else, that, that's been eliminated. So uh, they had a chicken plant downtown. Like, it, it just happens. That's, that's old yeah. industry that is in a sleepy town, and, and then the town goes to a more progressive kind of state. And, yeah. and that's where we're at with Greeley. So it's kind of see, uh, fun to see that, that progress happening. But uh, to answer your question, uh, the, the purchase really allowed us to really own our destiny. Uh, we are not control freaks. Maybe. <laughs> at the at the end of the day, and, and I and I think something that we've always been cognizant of is that at the end of the day, one of our facets of of who we are is being a, a manufacturing company. We manufacture beer, uh, and there's significant plan investment that goes into making said beer from canning lines to floor drains to sloping concrete to HVAC systems and, and chillers and uh, you name it. It, it is a, a very, very large expense to get something like this off the ground. We're not an office building full of uh, tech coders that uh, as long as you have AC and, and lights, you can work wherever. Uh, this isn't that kind of setup. So there, there had been a lot of investment made since day one to shore this place up. It, the building had been vacant seven years when we took it over uh, in, in our original lease. Um, there has been a lot of investment, blood, sweat, and tears, and monetary going into this place to make it suitable for, for brewing. And no brewery wants to move. Yeah. I guarantee you, no brewery <laughs> ever <laughs> wants to move. Uh, and this place is absolutely perfect for current growth, for future growth, and, and everything in between. Uh, so for us, this was it was this building or bust. Uh, if we did not get the lease on this building, we would not exist. There is literally no other place in, in Greeley that was suitable to the vision that, that Neil and I had at that time. Uh, thankfully, it, it is a large enough space that the, the main building is fit about 15,000 square feet uh, with kind of good high, very high ceilings in the back uh, uh, area where old uh, car service and repair used to happen. They used to work on tractors and all that sort of stuff back there. So we ha it's the perfect place. It's the perfect place to brew. Uh, now, can we go beyond 60, 90 barrel tanks? No. Will we ever? Probably not. You know, we're in a very sweet spot. Uh, we satiate the, the local market. We don't have any big plans to go regional or anything along those lines. So the, the footprint, the production equipment, the space, the investment all fits where we are naturally headed uh, without a whole lot of heavy lifting. Sure. So it just, it just made sense, and, and kudos to our uh, previous uh, landlords. These are cats that, that bought up all of downtown Greeley when there was tumbleweeds flowing through downtown. There wasn't anything. I've been here for 20 years. There wasn't anything going on downtown. No. There was the Rio, and there was the Rio. <laughs> 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 Truly. And yeah. uh, to see what it's blown up to, uh, to, uh, to Bricks, to Right Coast, to Wiley Roots, and uh, Wiley Woods was here before us, so uh, they definitely get the kudos there. Uh, shit, Crabtree used to be uh, down in this area uh, in the spot that Wiley Roots occupies to, to Rio. Now Luna is the Moxie Theater, Patrick's Irish Pub, and, and all of these really, really great places um, that have been very profitable and well supported by the community. People are waking up to what a downtown vibe is here in Greeley after it being dormant for so long. We we're not gifted the cool of, of Fort Collins, Old Town, or, or Rhino, or, or Lodo, or anything like that. Uh, so we've really had to struggle for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But it's paid off. I, I'm sure. with you there. I mean, if, if I had the, I live in Windsor, and if I have the option to drive 30 minutes into Fort Collins or 15 minutes to downtown Greeley, I'm picking downtown Greeley every time. Exactly. There's plenty right, to do man. here, and, and it's just. And that's something that people, you know, and I, I feel, I love what we bring to that, what is Greeley conversation and starting to change the, the, the kind of dynamic of, of how people view Greeley. 
Um, but I would put us up against Windsor's downtown any old day. We have way more entertainment oh, and options yeah. here in Greeley than yeah. Windsor does. But everybody Windsor has oh, nothing. Like, yeah. <laughs> bring, bring it on, Windsor. <laughs> no. ready for it. I, I'm going to agree with you there. It's, it's one of the things that, I, that aggravates me the most about Windsor is at 10 o'clock, they roll up the sidewalks. And there's right. nothing going on. And Loveland's I mean, kind of the same way, too. Yeah. Um, but again, uh, back to my original point, I mean, thank, thank God our, our original uh, landlords here invested so heavily in the Greeley downtown area when there was tumbleweeds blowing through there. And there literally was not anything. And they went through and bought damn near everything. And they got a great deal. They had that vision. They had that 20, 30-year vision of where this was headed and made the appropriate investments. But not only did that, that helped people like like us mm-hmm. start up for a song. I mean, a, a seven-year uh, improvements loan that was 0% interest. They were absolutely dedicated to, and prof, you know, profit-wise, they're looking at that. If we hit the home run from a brewery standpoint, we make all their other properties more valuable. Right. So it's win-win. But they definitely didn't have to give us a zero percent loan sure. to do it, yeah. but that's just who they were, yeah. who I, they are. And I think it speaks to Greeley as, you know, I think it's been long overlooked, you know, and, and that's like, we fought that for so long. We don't even have to fight it anymore. No one even asked why Greeley, why not Denver? Because there's opportunity in Greeley that doesn't exist. And mm-hmm. to Colin's point too, I mean, you know, Bob and Travis, our landlords were, I mean, what they, what they did to help us get off the ground, I don't think you'll find those kinds of circumstances, those kinds of offers and deals, I, you won't find them anywhere in Colorado, um, and mm-hmm. much less than a town of 110. I mean, 110,000 now is is it's a we've got a booming population that's that can sustain a lot more breweries than we have, um, and you know, my we have we have a. I'm sleeping with the uh, executive director of the downtown development <laughs> authority. So, full disclosure. Separate beds. Yes. Separate beds. Yeah. Just full disclosure. We have a bias. So, uh, but but she, my wife, Bianca. Um, I'm glad. I'm glad you sorry, added the yeah, wife sorry, part. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Who's listening to this podcast? <laughs> Honey, I love you. Uh, but we, you know, she, you know, just like I mean, I think that's. Like Colin said, there wasn't, we didn't look any, even outside of downtown, there was never, Worldworks wasn't really intended to be anywhere else. And so, you know, she, she was able to advocate for us to get this building. That was a, that was a struggle. And it, I just, I don't, we don't, maybe we would have found something down the road, but it wouldn't have been the same and it wouldn't have had the opportunities we had. Um, and we, that's what you find in Greeley. That's what you find is people that, you know, obviously at the end of the day, you have to make money. You have to, yeah. it has to be sustainable. Um, but there's there's a lot of people like you know you know Bob and um, other investors downtown that are more concerned with seeing a downtown thrive and seeing a community thrive and seeing arts thrive and seeing creativity thrive selflessly selflessly, selflessly. yeah and yeah. and I I think that's what you know that's the story that doesn't get told as much as it should be um, you know and I think we're excited to, to be on that that timeline of Greeley's growth it is it is I think exciting for us to be a part of that and I yeah. You know, just like New Belgium and Odell in, in Old Town and kind of that part of Fort Collins, you know, now it's a totally different area. Right. Um, but those two breweries in particular are a big kind of linchpin for the, the growth and change in Fort Collins. They're not the only ones. They're not exclusively the ones that have contributed to the growth there, but they're a big part of that history. And I think we're just excited to have our part in Greeley's growth and change in history. Yeah, yeah. And with, you know, with Wiley Roots being your very, you know, very near neighbor, I think it, it really opens up an opportunity to turn this area of Greeley into a similar area of what Odell's and New Belgium has done with with that area of, of Fort Collins, where you have an avenue for more breweries to open up. And like you said, there's plenty of population here for more breweries. It's, it's all good things for Greeley. And where did this bourbon come from? <laughs> what bourbon? What bourbon? I don't see any bourbon. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is actually one we dump from a barrel we're filling. This is one we're of the. This is one of the perks, right? Yeah. We, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we, we we source a lot of barrels. Selfishly, we're always hoping that there's some extra left behind. <laughs> and sh- sure enough, there was some there extra. There just happened left. to be some. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, you know, we do the we do our diligence. We dump it out into 
So our glass is to drink. Make sure it's delicious. <laughs> to make sure it's no, quality no, control. No it's all part of quality control. control. <laughs> Damn. Fine. We're going to have a good time. It's, it's delicious bourbon. I felt bad because I kept going back to that rather than going to the beers. Yeah, but the beers are great, too. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. Right. yeah, let's talk about the stuff we made, baby. <laughs> it's great. We make great beer. <laughs> well, it's, it's actually a really good segue into that. You know, the fact that you guys are growing and you've, you've now purchased the building and adjoining buildings, it only means more barrel-aged beer, right? I mean, that's the only thing it can mean. Not necessarily. <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we don't play the scarcity game. We never will. Sure. Uh, we do what we can within the confines of, of the equipment and the people and the resources at hand. And I don't know. We, we keep we keep trying to figure out more ways to boost Noche production, uh, and it's just not coming forward to us. Uh, there's just not an easy way forward. As as big as this space is, and as much as uh, as big as the opportunity that this whole entire plot allows, the fact is is that we have a school district renting. The, the south edge of it, uh, supporting a, a very innovative. Super cheap, dude. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting a good deal. <laughs> uh, supporting a very innovative uh, school design, teaching design that is a, the first of its kind in, in Greeley. And these guys really don't have any other where to, any other place to go. So yeah, we could kick them out and we could scrap the the building, uh, scrape the the that area, good and do <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Wilderix is gonna scrape. Wilderix hates children. <laughs> You know, and, and that sucked too. When we when we did first buy the the plot, one of the headlines was like Greeley or you know Weldworks buys the block. What's going to happen to the school? And it's like, right. stay in put, guys. Stop it. Like yeah. we're, we're we threw cool. a pizza party. <laughs> right. And we do that. We throw pizza parties for them. We love them. They're great. Uh, we got to stop bearded men from lining up by their playground uh, yeah, for, yeah, for yeah. our Noche release. There's only so many things under our control. Right. <laughs> exactly. Right. But you would be surprised at the, uh, I mean, what's our, our current kind of a average aging time is, is 16 to 18 months for, for Noche in the barrel. And with the, the amount of turns that we can do in the brew house and still kick out a lager. Mm-hmm. And to keep Juicy going and to have a half and to do everything that we want to do, uh, it, the resources truly are, are limited. So uh, there's zero plans for a barrel house or anything like that. We are actively really, truly trying to figure out where we can store more barrels. It, right now, there's not a, a, a path forward. There's just not. Well, you brought Skip in, who knows his way around a barrel. He's kind of good with a barrel. And, he uh, knows some barrels. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, with that, is there uh, is there going to be an introduction of maybe some new sour beers mm. or things along that line? Mm. That's an interesting question. <laughs> we, I think we probably go back and forth on this this point mm. daily. Um, yeah, we really do. I'd say six months ago, eight months ago, we thought for sure we're going to carve out a space for dedicated sour production. Um, we we filled sour b- barrels the same time we filled Midi Noche in that first month we were open. So um, that was a, a part of our original and plan was to, to do mixed culture, barrel-aged beers alongside clean beers. Not in the same room, we learned that, but moved them out. But um, the barrels we're, we're looking at right now here in the tap room are still filled with mixed culture, sour saison, and other stuff. I'm guessing not all of them are great. I'm sure we've, we're making some really great malt vinegar in a few of them, but we have some fooders as well that we were aging and that we conditioned now and uh, we moved them out of the fooders and into stainless. Um, and then we just filled them back up with Chester King. So um, I think, honestly, the future of the sour program is definitely in flux. It's We don't have an answer. Today, the answer is we'll continue to carve out time and space and, uh, you know, production as, 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 it's, as it makes sense. So, you know, when Chester King is coming out for, you know, the Craft Brewers Conference and they ask if you guys want to brew a mixed culture beer together, you say yes. Yeah, you don't, yep. figure you out don't how to say make no to work. that. <laughs> um, same is true for lots of other great mixed culture producers that we want to work with. Um, and that might be the future. Maybe it's just collabs that, you know, fit. It's not that we're, you know... There's a lot of breweries that have tons more experience, but we're not completely noobs to to mixed culture beer. We won a a World Beer Cup medal for a barrel-aged fruited sour. Um, I don't know how many breweries that have done one 
can win a, a World Beer Cup medal and then kind of retire. We're, we're coming out of retirement, though. That's the short answer. Is that was Peach Climenteric? Peach Climenteric. Yeah. So the only, the only one we released took a bronze at World Beer Cup. Um, it would have been fun to drop the mic and walk away, um, which I think we talked about for a little while. But I think the other reality is we love, we love those beers. Like Colin mentioned earlier, we like producing what we like to drink. Um, it's not necessarily our bread and butter. It's also not, I think, where we can – there's so many great – mixed culture ex- producers in Colorado, much less the rest of the country. We don't want to just throw another example into that mix. Right. Um, like you said, Skip's got great experience, and we've got tons of knowledge between everyone here. Um, and so I think if we, we continue forward with it, it's got to be a perspective that's uniquely Weldworks. Yeah. And so finding that and finding our voice in that market is kind of our first priority. Um, I will say Peach, Peach Climate Tarek, um, you know, was a, a good indicator of where we would probably go with it, which is probably more barrel forward than your average barrel aged sour. Um, a lot of that beer, almost 40% of that beer was first use bourbon or second use bourbon technically, but we didn't do media noche like we had in some of the others. So our original intent was take media noche only gets one use. So we get fresh bourbon barrels. It gets many noche gets racked into those. And after that, that barrel's done for all intents and purposes for us for clean beer it could have a longer life with mixed culture, but you know we didn't grow that mixed culture program like we planned, so those barrels go away. Um, but Pe- Peach Comic Terrick was a little bit of the exception. We about almost uh, you know two thirds of that, or a third of that, sorry, was uh, a little over a third was actual bourbon. At the same time we filled Made in Oche, and so it added this, uh, I guess, a little bit more emphasis on the oak and maybe even the spirits, which I, there's not as many examples of that, and that's what we do really well. We we understand barrels, we understand bourbon, we understand spirits, we understand oak really, really well. So how can we adapt that knowledge we've learned from Media Noche into mixed culture beer? We're not making sour Media Noche. Make sure I'm clear on that. <laughs> <laughs> have enough of those issues. Um, I was worried but, there. <laughs> so we can, one of those we can glean the aging. And what we learned from aging out. and what we learned from <laughs> barrel true. aging and what flavors we get, I think could be something that could, could set us apart a little bit. Um, but it's not something that we're, you know, we will have another climacteric release. I'll say that. Huh. We'll have one this year. Um, I won't tell you when because I don't know. <laughs> the, we've added fruit. Tomorrow. It's, yep. It's actually <laughs> available for sale to, as soon as you listen to this podcast. <laughs> line up at the door. We'll have raspberry climacteric is coming yeah, at you. I was going to say this podcast will release Fake on Monday. News. So yeah. you better oh, be ready. Okay, never mind. Fake <laughs> news. Fake news. <laughs> so, um, so we are, we're not abandoning it. Uh, we, we've had it on hold for a while. It will the mixed culture program will kind of soft relaunch and then sure. who knows what the future is. I think when we have so many great mixed culture producers in the state and friends of ours out of state that want to come and hang out, you know, it doesn't make sense to brew an IPA with Jester King. It doesn't make right. sense to do that with other breweries too. Yeah. So as we can fit them in and we do have those two, you know, we've got two 11 hectoliter fooders that are beautiful, uh, older, uh, San Joe this, uh, that we, can continue to fill and use and create a house culture, but it's not something we're going to invest a lot of time and, and resources into sure. at the moment. You guys got enough going on right now. Yeah, a little bit. A little <laughs> bit. Well, well it, it's it, to, to Neil's point too. We anything we do will be done with uh, I- immense inten- intentionality. Uh, we're not going to just uh, oh here here's a, a small garage space that's not connected to the building. Let's, let's just shove a bunch of uh, barrels in there, and that'll be our sour program. We're either going to do it and do it the right way, or we're not. Right. And unfortunately, doing it comes at the expense of a lot of the other plans that that we have uh, moving forward. So we just got to try to balance it the best we can and, and find that right way forward. But um, we're not going to do anything haphazardly. Okay. Well, I promised Jake that I wouldn't take more than an hour, and I'm already pushing that. So. Um, Are you good, baby? I, I want to get into. Uh, I also want to talk a little bit about uh, Colorado Springs. And your your op your move down south. Another thing that's on Kristen's plate. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a really exciting month. <laughs> Two months. Uh, um, yeah, I mean it's uh it, we're just so excited to be joining that community. I mean we uh, lovingly call it um, our Thanks little. Thanks, Colin. No, no, He's a radio guy. He knows. <laughs> <laughs> um, we lovingly refer to it as our little outpost uh, because it's it's going to be um, a Weldworks home base that is whatever the city of Colorado Springs wants it to be. Uh, we're not trying to recreate what we have up here. We want to make it a very Colorado Springs specific um, experience and uh, found a 
very intimate little spot uh, in old Colorado City that we purchased um, back in March, and we're actually starting renovations on, like, demo this week, basically. Uh, things are just moving full force ahead, um, but it, it's going to be very, you know, DIY, um, very quaint, but get all the love and attention that we give our spot up here as well. That's great. And it's so you, you already have a home down down there. We and do. So it's um I mean really I I mean what can people expect in, in Colorado Springs? What can they or do you even know that yet? Cozy? <laughs> <laughs> what's what what's the is it Matt T V that had that lowered expectations like clip or well, like yeah. lowered, <laughs> lowered yeah. expectations? Yeah. <laughs> we, it was funny because Chris and I went down there a couple of weeks ago when we met with the city architects and builder and everything else. And um, uh, it's funny because you we had a couple of things set up, too, with breweries and, and accounts and whatnot. And just like, hey, what's the word and everything else? And kind of the rumors that were flying around were just... I mean, it's just insane stuff. Wildworks goes and buys another city block. Like, now we own Wendy's. I'm like, all this other stuff. Man, if I own we Wendy's. We don't own Wendy's? I thought we owned Wendy's. <laughs> if we own Wendy's, like, just kiss me goodbye. Like, it's just the end of me right there. <laughs> Frosties and fries forever. <laughs> uh, uh, you're one of those people? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. Yeah, we, there's a lot of points of disagreement on this. Uh, and this I like mayo with, with my French fries. Oh, okay, take that. Get on board with take that. That. I, well, I like mayo with my frosty. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you just one up to me. Uh, All right. Who wants All right. who wants whipped cream when you can have mayo on your frosty? <laughs> <Right. Whipped mayo. laughs> we definitely have our challenges with the with this space, and uh, and we do want to come in to Kristen's point. Uh, very much built for the Colorado Springs community. This is not an outpost for Denverites to come down and get the same to go options that they have up here. The same options will be available. This is not a redheaded stepchild, kind of a, a, a forced, uh, uh, you know, limited release kind of stuff with, with what we're doing in the Springs. But it is simply there to exist for the people of Colorado Springs. Um, anybody in Denver, if you're in Castle Rock or Lone Tree, come on down. Like, we'll hook you up with, with some cases. Um, <laughs> but if you're in Denver proper and, and above uh, uh, ways north, you need to still come to Greeley. Um, it's an, a more intimate environment. Uh, it's going to be much more draft heavy. It's going to be much more built around that that sitting down experience, uh, not just coming up to Greeley, having a beer because you've got to drive two hours to get back home and go out with four cases. This is not that kind of play. Four cases? Okay, <laughs> five or six. <laughs> How many can you fit on a dolly? I six. <laughs> right. six. Dolly, yeah. You know, I mean, I've done Dolly ten, Martin. but <laughs> uh, I've definitely seen more than four cases at a time coming yes. out of this place. <laughs> yes, but it, but but again, um, what we're trying to do is just replicate what we've done here in Greeley. Again, Colorado Springs is an underserved community, in in our opinion. There's great breweries down there that have uh, that are doing great, that have blazed the trail, and and that's a a, a great beer scene. But we're just looking forward to jumping in there kind of humble, low-key, just for residents, create a really cool kind of patio space that overlooks the mountains and and just kind of be kind of a divey kind of place. This mm-hmm. place used to be called The Dive, and it was a little hamburger joint, and it was a piece of crap. I mean, just to be blunt, um, we're going to put though. some some <laughs> lipstick on this pig, and we're going to make it re- look really nice, <laughs> and the, the views are going to be incredible, and we're going to keep people in their seats a little bit more than we are able to do up here, uh, and that's just going to be a different experience, but we're looking, again, looking forward to that challenge of, can we create that same customer expectation and, and recreate that customer experience uh, that we have developed up here in Greeley. So again, it's going to stretch our operations, our strategies, our people, our, our everything to try to execute this in the same vein because we are absolutely dedicated to it being in the same vein. If it's not, it's going to go away. And we'll we'll try again or we'll just scrap it or whatever, but we're not going to do anything half-assed ever. If it's not hitting the mark for whatever reason, we will figure it out. Uh, absolutely, but um, we definitely want to make sure that the intent of this location is is well communicated. Um, and to 
Obviously, the space is limited. It's what, 1,300 square feet? 1,200. 1,200 square oh, feet. Oh, that is small. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, but there's, you know, a lot of on-street parking, and we're working on parking issues and everything else. We're there's figuring no seats, out. Though. No one's going to sit down. There's there. no seats. Standing room standing only. only. <laughs> standing room only. Ooh, I like it's that It's a idea. low <laughs> occupancy, um, but uh, the, the plans, I think, once they come out, and they'll uh, be out in the next couple of weeks, but... The plans, once they're out, I think we're going to blow people's minds quite a bit. Um, but we're very much looking forward to being across the street from uh, Fossil Brewery, being down the street from uh, Cerberus, uh, and being catty corner from Trails and Tap Room. Like, it's just good company to be in. So yeah. happy to support that scene and to, and to make a splash. So Cool. And, Jake, what are, I mean, what are the challenges with this new environment from a marketing standpoint and a, you know, promotional standpoint? Uh, you know, just making sure that you assimilate properly into the the, the community that already exists there. Um, you know, the last thing we want anyone you know to think is that you know here, here comes Weldworks, kind of you know trying to bust down the door of Colorado Springs. You know, like Colin was saying, it's nothing like that whatsoever. We just happen to have found a community that to us feels like home the same way that Greeley kind of feels like home it has a lot of the same work ethic it has a lot uh, uh, the, the demographics are similar uh, people of value people who work hard people who just you know at the end of the day want to go sit down and have a good look at the mountains and have a beer and this I think one of the things that hopefully it really becomes known for is the view from this spot is bonkers it's incredible and we're, we have like multiple patios that people can be taking that view in from kind of maybe not quite the the quote-unquote third space that people talk about where you just maybe sit there for eight hours and and work but kind of heading more towards that um and I, the, the challenge from the, you know they're really i wouldn't say there is a, a challenge from the marketing side it's an opportunity it is an ability to engage with people who are very similar to the community that we have grown up in here so it's it is kind of a second home it's not uh it's not something that we're doing for any other reason than we saw this really amazing place and said yeah we we'd like to be a part of what's happening here and so anything that we can bring to that table uh, is is just kind of butter at the end of the day. If you know we make a partnership with you know Trails End across the street and we do collabs with Cerebrus, it's it's how can we fit into what's already happening here more than anything else. So I I don't know if there's much of a challenge. It's just like uh, let's just see how many friends we can make and uh, how much we can help the community impact of this area through through whatever it is that we bring to the table. And, and, and to me, that's that's bringing a spotlight uh, a little bit. And we don't think of ourselves as like an 800-pound grill or anything like that. But we definitely know the cachet that, that we bring to an area, and, and we are absolutely humbled by that. But but that said, we love operating in, in areas that are cast in a improper light. Greeley gets a, a, a ding just because you say Greeley. And it instantly brings all of these key words out that are that are negative, and it's you ask people, it's like, when was the last time you were there? Oh, I've never been there. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, you know, and so you're kind of you're you're fighting against that tide uh, quite a bit, and and it's the same story in Colorado Springs as well. Um, oh, Colorado Springs, uh, hyper conservative, you know, you know, focused on the family, like that, that's all you hear, Air Force retired military and there's definitely elements of that and I'm proud to be in that environment of people that have served this country but it's not the story of what Colorado Springs is today right again when was the last time you've been to Colorado Springs when was the last time you checked out their downtown look at the list of places that opened up in 2018 and what's on the slate to open up in 2019 it's a cool town with a lot going on and a lot to offer and a vibe again in, in my opinion underserved uh everybody that's there that's serving it is is doing great they're hitting all the the marks and everything else but people in denver and beyond still have this 
negative eye towards that community and it's not proper and we love going into those kind of communities as we've done enjoyed going into into Greeley and changing people's mindsets and resetting what what the 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 focus and the keywords on a community can be yeah I love how many people were like shocked that we were like our second location is Colorado Springs. Guess like, you don't like know. money. Yeah, or, yeah. It's like, <laughs> why not Denver Fort Collins? Like, we opened our brewery in Greeley, <laughs> so I, I don't. So I, the disconnect for most people is, I mean, for me, it's unfathomable. Like, of course, our second location would. I mean, we love those communities. We love Boulder. We love Fort Collins. We love right. Denver. But there's a reason we've done what we've done, and I think people people just think I think that we just. I don't know. Maybe we don't think through things, or I, I would say we crunch more numbers and are more intentional and strategic than almost any brewery in the state. Uh, is if, as far as the scope that we have. I mean, obviously, every, everyone's gonna we're gonna correct and make, but there's there's opportunity there. Like Colin said, it's a thriving community that's growing. The, the story's not been told. I love. The, I saw some post on I don't remember which whether it was forum or social media where it was, but someone said like the you know. Worldworks announced the second location. The only thing that was more disappointing than Greeley was Colorado Springs, and that for me was edifying. <laughs> like it was like exactly that's right. exactly what the story you want to tell is that yeah. we love we've fallen in love with Colorado Springs, and we're not even from there. We don't nope. we have roots there. We have some people that we have friends and family that that live there, but it's it's not our home like Greeley was. But we're excited about it being our second home because we love that. I mean, we love that. You know, we we are. The underdog story that, like I said, it would be a movie one day. I can't wait to find out. <laughs> it's to be an underdog story of Walt Is it Matt McConaughey going to play? Uh, no, he's playing Colin. Oh. Yeah. Colin already called that, that's My me. fingers crossed. Ryan Reynolds, if you're listening to this, <laughs> if you would play me in the film adaptation of the World War story, that would be all I need in life. I'm going to go see Detective... I'm going to go see Detective Pikachu, spot, not because man, I, don't know. I love Pokemon, but you I want to grow a beard, Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> Sorry. Can Pikachu please? Uh, enough fanboys about Taylor Swift and uh, Ryan Reynolds. Leave me alone. Um, but that's, like, for us, well, what I think is, like, that, it truly does, I think, tell the story of why we're excited is we know that's an unfair picture, just right. like we knew it was in Greeley, and we want to be a part of, you know, there's plenty of people that have already been actively working to change that story. We're just excited for us to be on that timeline and be a part of that story of like, okay, that now in in ten years, that's the coolest part. You know, we opened in twenty fifteen. So in twenty twenty, so five years after we opened, nobody will talk about Greeley the same way they did in twenty fifteen. Not just because of us, but that's that's a reality. The mm-hmm. same is true for Colorado Springs. Yep. Five years from now, people won't have the same conversations about Colorado Springs. And that's for us is like that's what gets that's what gets us excited. That's what we that drives us is that that idea of like true um, like paradigm shifts and changes that are impactful and and sustainable and will continue to change that history because um, you know the, the stories of Denver and Fort Collins and Boulder they're not they're not already told and done but there's not as much room to to be a part of groundwork and I we are excited about those opportunities sure. and, and we very much promise that it's not just going to be the old hamburger joint we're <laughs> we're going to make some upgrades so <laughs> Hot dogs, <for> sure. <laughs> don't tease don't tease <laughs> corn dogs are near and dear to my heart <laughs> with mayo <laughs> Just saying. I think that's a good note to leave it on right there. <laughs> yeah, I always leave it on. Hot dogs and mayo. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't take anything from this podcast, I hope you learned that mayo is the perfect companion for french fries, hot dogs, corn dogs, and corn dogs. Corn dogs. And yeah. Apparently for all salad. Yeah. In here. Uh, if you're just, just slather me with mayo. Let's just get it over with. make the mic drop sound without dropping this mic. <laughs> We don't want to drop this mic. No, they look very nice. Matt, we will not I drop can, your mic. I can edit that in. It's okay. fine. I can, I can edit in a mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> guys, um, well, first off, I appreciate the, um, the time that you guys took today. And, Neil, I appreciate the fact that you have been so open with, over the years, with not only brewing advice and brewing tips, but, I mean, sharing recipes and things with, with home brewers. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, you're one of the, with the, the work and the writing that you do, you're, you're one of the more open craft brewers out there. You, you don't hold anything in. It's not like, oh, this is my secret. You know, I'm sure you do have a few of those secrets, but um, it seems not like... Not many for, anymore. But. <laughs> it seems like for craft brewers, um, 
and and being a, a home brewer myself, it's uh, it's good to see someone who's willing to embrace where they came from and give that advice. And well, thank you. I mean, uh, to be completely transparent, I stole that uh, verbatim from uh, Vinny you know, <laughs> and his approach to to Pliny the Elder. Yeah, so yeah, um, that for me was a like fundamental. Like improve my brewing to be able to take his recipe, drink his beer, and and now to, to connect with him at a, you know I think my highlights in my brewing career, professional career was being two booths down from him at Firestone Walker last year, talking about and I've met him at GBF and um, but that for me was like well if he's you know done that for the home brewing community why can't we do the same and sure so yeah yeah I I wish I could take credit for the idea but thank you for the credit well but, you, you know, know I, it's <laughs> I, we also operate out of I like we don't have fear we yeah we're not exactly. arrogant we're not we're we can't be arrogant we can be cocky but we're all we're brewers not, are arrogant. at our, don't, at don't, our don't, nature we're not don't fool yourself. It, it's, out of a, it's out of confidence and so yeah. we, when when you when you operate out of confidence and you operate without fear you can share everything because the way we do it's not the same way you do it but if you can if you can make a better ipa because of what we tell you that's awesome and we, yeah you know yeah. the Challenge accepted. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And we would love to have an IPA showdown if you want to all brew juicy bits. We can see whose <laughs> be- version is best. But. Well, and, it, you know, it's also been really great to see, um, you know, like I said, having a brewery like this right here in our backyard in northern Colorado. Um, I think that it's it's put northern Colorado kind of back on the map a little bit um, that, uh, you know, the, the Denver scene is so strong and, and there's so much going on down there that I think some people sometimes forget that we have a lot going on up here and, Absolutely. and uh, it's not just Fort Collins. So truly. Yeah. I appreciate you guys taking the time today. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Thanks. Matt. Yeah, thank appreciate you. It. Yeah. Appreciate it, bud. Cheers. Cheers.